this next panel, I think, is, is going to be extremely interesting, as Joseph set us up earlier after talking about all of the, hearing all of the wonderful things um, that have inspired us to think of new ways to work in the food system. We have a bunch of people who are experts at getting things done within the system from various aspects of it. Um, and to tell us more about it and to tell us more about our panelists and to make his own presentation, it's a great pleasure to introduce a new friend of the foundation, Ricardo Salvador, who's a program officer at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, responsible um, specifically for the foundation's food system programming. Um, and, and the emphasis on that in particular is uh, vulnerable communities and how um, some of the, all of the ideas that we've been talking about really can help the people who are most in need in our country, um, the stakeholders who often don't have a voice in the food system. So it's a pleasure to welcome Ricardo to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to support and to partner uh, with the Beard Foundation because doing this work uh, is supporting the work that the Kellogg Foundation has been doing. Uh, as was just mentioned, the Kellogg Foundation has an agenda which is a social justice agenda around supporting vulnerable children, their parents, their communities so that those children can become fulfilled, successful citizens and the future of this country. And of course, food is one of the most vital pillars of fulfilling that particular vision. So I also have the privilege of introducing um, today's uh, luminaries on the panel. And before doing that, I'd like to say a few words about how the Kellogg Foundation has been supporting the work and partnering uh, with many of the folks, both who were honored last night, as well as many of the organizations that are present here. And uh, I would like to, to do that by providing a framework for what I see the, the discussion being here during the panel uh, as being a convergence point for many points of commonality that have emerged over the last couple of days, uh, with the major themes clearly being uh, power, money, flavor, with multiple entendres around flavor, as well as story. And the particular story or narrative around the food system that we are here to discuss and to overcome is that tired trope of enjoying the safest, cheapest food supply in the world that helps many important things become invisible to us so that we don't think about what we're doing when we do the natural thing three times a day when we get hungry and eat. So our task is to make many things that are currently invisible visible so that we know what priorities exist in order to be able to reform this system. And um, the concept of system, as you know, is that of a set of multiple parts that are working in coordination toward a particular end that either is a human intention or is interpreted by humans, is imputed by humans. I want to quote to you one of the most brilliant things that I've heard said about the food system uh, by Hal Hamilton, who is sitting here many years ago when we were supporting the Sustainable Food Lab, which was the product of Hal's uh, vision uh, together with many partners, when he said that one thing that was important to understand about intervening in the food system is that there is no central office of the food system. So there, there, there is no particular leverage point that you can go to when you say, I want to transform this particular system. There are multiple parts, which many of you in this room have already recognized by your statements, we must work with in parallel simultaneously in order to produce the end results that we envision, that we desire. So uh, whereas uh, many of you are uh, grantees or are aware of the support that the Kellogg Foundation does to support uh, the good food movement, uh, I want to um, disabuse uh, any of us, and it's good for us at the Cal Foundation to hear this ourselves, that we essentially make random grants to things that look good in the food world and actually provide the framework that guides our thinking about the support that we provide. And it, it simply has to do with the vision that uh, if you desire to build a log house, it means that you not only need to have an idea of how that log house is built and you not only need to have a hatchet, you not, not only need to have logs, that means that somehow there's a steel foundry out there that's providing for those hatchets. And that means that somehow there's a forest that you're drawing from in order to get the logs, in order to be able to build a log house. So we believe that it's very important to support not only the work in the field, but also to build the field in the environment and the context that makes it possible for people to make the decisions that we are advocating. So that once those families or those school food directors decide that they are going to change the way in which they provide food for their children, the options are available, they're actionable, they're reasonably in front of them, and they don't have to fight the food system, they don't have to be heroes in order to be able to accomplish those goals. 
So we operate in parallel. Let me give you a few examples. Our examples of field building uh, have been mentioned uh, already. We support the Partnership for Healthy America, which is a, a, a project that works in tandem with the Let's Move um, uh, project that was described by Sam uh, Cass and which has been discussed over these last uh, two days. It is targeted specifically at large-scale industries uh, provide th to work with them to provide alternatives uh, to the way in which the system currently works. We work with many funder collaboratives. You may know about the Convergence Partnership. You may know about Agri, uh, for instance. Uh, here we've already recognized the work of Food Corps, the Farm to School Network. Uh, Many of the honorees last night, as well as um, uh, Anna Lape, who was introducing a couple of the honorees last night, were members of the Food and Community Fellows, uh, which is a program of the Kellogg Foundation, which is predicated on the function that narrative matters and leadership matters. And we support both of those in the embodiment of these future uh, leaders. And then this work actually lands on the ground in work such as uh, what we just had described by Haile and Tatiana. It says work actually in the field where we're supporting uh, mom and pop when they're advocating for better food for their kids and junk food outside of school, when they go to the local school board, when they work with local policy councils. We've supported the work of the Iowa Food Policy Council, the North Carolina Policy Council, and we supported a Healthy Schools campaign in Chicago, something that also Sam Cass was involved with uh, when he was in, in Chicago. And so hopefully these will provide you uh, examples of the rationale uh, within which the Kellogg Foundation decides that it's going to architect its food systems programming so that you see that it is not a set of random parts out there in isolation doing targeted good, but that it's actually a vision of coordinating multiple interacting parts so that we end up with an intended goal. And that goal is to increase the amount of good food and let me define that for you and then introduce our panelists to speak about how uh, their visions uh, may fit into this. And I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am to hear many people referencing their participation in what is termed the good food movement. We came up with this concept uh, uh, a few years ago in 2007. And for us, it essentially uh, means that what is good for food for you is good food for everyone. And at that level, it's a very romantic concept, but made it very real by defining what is actually embodied by good food. And it is four characteristics simultaneously. Simultaneously, it is healthy, green, fair, and affordable. So I, I won't go through each of those. In this crowd, everyone can interpret what each of those four attributes actually mean. But we summarize it this way. Good food is good food because it exploits neither people nor nature. It exploits nothing. And it is not precious food, it is accessible to everyone, both physically and economically. And so with that, we now have four luminaries, uh, whom I will quickly introduce in succession here, who will be speaking to us about how they see their role in the interacting dynamics of power, money, flavor, and story in order to bring about and strengthen a world in which good food is the default option for all of us. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you, uh, in order of their speaking, I, I believe, I'll just read from the list here, Greg Drescher, who's the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Industry Leadership at the Culinary Institute of, of America, uh, followed by Jonathan Halperin, who's the President of Designing Sustainability, followed by Wendy Gilman, who is the Senior Policy Advisor uh, at the Office of Senator Kristen Gillibrand, and Michael Nishan, uh, who treated us in two different ways uh, last night, who is the co-founder of Wholesome Wave and chef of the dressing room. Please help me welcome them. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, going to give a, a few thoughts from the world of, of culinary uh, education. I think I've got a, uh, let's see, there we go. Some of you may have recognized, uh, that's our, uh, a little view of our uh, Hudson Valley uh, campus. And um, uh, I'll show you a little picture of our Napa Valley campus, just to give you, in case you're not familiar with it, we have four, four campuses, uh, California, New York, Texas, and uh, now in Singapore. Uh, we have about 3,000 students in degree programs. Every year we have about 3,000 students that come back for uh, advanced uh, educational opportunities. And we run a number of uh, industry leadership 
uh, initiatives, including this one, which is with the Harvard School of Public Health called Worlds of Healthy Flavors, which focuses on um, volume food service operators and integrating uh, health imperatives with uh, the insights from world cuisines and traditional cultures. Um, this program was very instrumental in driving uh, trans fats out of the, the food supply uh, uh, in the uh, volume uh, food service sector. Uh, we have another initiative uh, called uh, Healthy Flavors, Healthy Kids that we launched uh, last year in San Antonio, uh, appropriately very appropriate in, in uh, San Antonio, uh, which is the uh, epicenter of uh, childhood obesity in South Texas and all the diabetes problems. Uh, and this has a special focus on the Hispanic community uh, as, as well. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now in terms of sustainability and some thoughts um, for the future. So we have for our campuses a uh, uh, green campus initiative that we focused on um, six key areas, agricultural sustainability, uh, certainly campus planning is design, uh, communications and education, energy, non-food procurement, and resource uh, management. Um, we uh, have a, a you know major purchasing program with local farmers. Uh, Senator Schumer was just on campus uh, about 10 days ago, uh, calling on the USDA to uh, expand our support uh, for and connections with sustainable uh, agriculture. Um, our newest residence hall is LEED Gold certified. Uh, we have sustainable student gardens and sustainability is very much embedded in our um, industry leadership uh, programs. Uh, and also we think in terms of not only what are we doing on our campuses, but what are our graduates are doing. Uh, uh, we all know uh, Melissa Kelly, a uh, James Beard award winner, and all the work, great work that she's doing at Primo. Um, Steve Ells, uh, who is the founder of Chipotle, uh, who's speaking at our upcoming uh, Worlds of Flavor conference about the, his uh, vision for how uh, a volume food service can work such that he has greater throughput and he has a higher, uh, he can afford a higher uh, uh, food cost uh, that will support uh, what he calls food with integrity. <clears throat> but what I'd like to talk just briefly about is where I think we need to go. Uh, clearly, uh, sustainable agriculture is important. Everything that we've talked about in, in this room uh, over the last day or so is important. But I think increasingly we're going to need to talk about sustainable food choices and sustainable food systems, anticipating, as some people talked about yesterday, this uh, world population of, of 9 billion in less than 40 years. 2050 used to seem like a long ways away, but actually for students graduating from the Culinary Institute of America or any culinary school today, that's fully within their career. And so somebody mentioned yesterday we're going to end up with you know, the equivalent of two Chinas uh, before uh, 2050. Um, that's going to be a game changer long before we get to 2050. And I think, you know, a lot of people in, in our field, a lot of chefs have, have barely taken on sustainable agriculture and, you know, but we need to, to push uh, further and, and start to think about global food systems uh, and the impact of what happens um, all over the world. We saw uh, that connection uh, just recently between, um, uh, you know, spikes in commodity prices and, and so as somebody mentioned yesterday, the, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, you know, China, we had, we hosted, uh, or I actually went to a conference uh, at the University of California, Davis, last year. All, all the presidents of all the uh, universities uh, in China that are responsible for food and agriculture uh, and uh, food science made presentations about um, all they're doing to drive up uh, animal agriculture and uh, the food processing industry with just startling graphs uh, of what their plans are. Um, and, you know, there's just, uh, it, it, to the extent that we're uh, trending away from traditional plant-based diets, uh, these, you know, cannot possibly coexist uh, with 9 billion people uh, without widespread food insecurity, political instability. And, uh, and all of the environmental degradation that, that comes with that. So that's the path that we're, we're on. Um, you know, these are some of the, uh, you know, sort of that you think about the genius of, of traditional plant-based diets around the world. Um, you know, these are not diets of deprivation. There's a lot of great food and a lot of great flavor out there. And these are the kinds of, of foods and flavors that people are, this guy, by the way, is, probably has to sell all those by the end of the day. Um, uh, you know, th these are the kinds of things that we're we're moving away from. Unfortunately, in China is, is uh, you know leading the the charge there. Um, so these are kind of some of the questions that that I think about is um, 
uh, you know, can chefs elevate the status of, of plant foods? Uh, throughout the world of chefs, uh, from culinary schools to culinary competitions, uh, I, I was the MC of the uh, National Association of College, uh, College University Food Service co culinary competitions for several years, and every year the theme was a protein. You know, the, the competition is around beef, or it's around pork, or it's around chicken. And I, the, my last year of doing that, I said, if I'm going to do this one more year, we're going to focus on a vegetable. How about just once? Um, and, and there is this issue, and, and of course, the next piece of this is restaurant economics. Uh, you know, we all go into restaurants and we say, what do you, you know, if you're picking a wine, what are you going to order? I'm going to have the chicken, I'm going to have the beef, I'm going to have the fish, and so forth. Uh, that's how, and that's ingrained in not only our thinking, but also in restaurant economics. Um, another question is to what extent will commodity prices, the rise in commodity prices, take care of some of this? I had an interesting conversation um, this spring. Uh, somebody mentioned, a couple of people have mentioned Darden restaurants with a head of uh, purchasing for produce for Darden. And uh, he said, you know, quite apart from any other reason, just because of rising commodity prices, they're going to start trimming protein across all their concepts uh, in, in the next year. And they, their projected increase in produce spend for 2012 is 10 percent, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, and then I think the, the, the other thing that we think a lot about is can we leverage synergies between health and environmental imperatives to unify messages. Um, there, there have been a fair number of references here to health and wellness and nutrition over the last day or so, but you know, I find that the health and wellness and public you know, nutrition, public health community, and the environmental community still are fairly separate communities, and um, there's not nearly the, um, the overlap that, that uh, there needs to be and the integration that there needs to be. Um, uh, but a lot of these issues will play out very differently in different parts of the industry. I think when we talk about chefs in this room, sometimes we're talking, we're referencing fine dining chefs. Fine dining chefs are a very small sliver of the $600 billion food service industry. And I think that's part of what we need to do uh, also as we go forward. When we talk about chefs and the potential leadership role of chefs is to clarify um, what it is, uh, who, are, who we're talking about, and what are the opportunities to leverage the, that leadership in different parts um, of our, our industry. And I, I think then, you know, can we, um, can we educate next generation chefs to follow where the environmental and health sciences lead us? Uh, building on a comment yesterday from Jose Andres, uh, chefs are going to have to uh, gain new skills. We're going to have to be comfortable uh, talking about science and economics and pushing, uh, you know, and, and uh, I often listen to chefs um, who are trying to do the right thing but are, are, you know, get off into the weeds in terms of the science and that uh, doesn't help help our cause in terms of, uh, uh, of engaging other folks. Um, and then, you know, the final piece of this is um, the biggest challenge is can we do all this and still end up with uh, great hospitality in our restaurants and James Beard award-winning food? And I would uh, uh, answer that a resounding yes, but I think we have our, our work to do. Um, and with that, I will close. Thank you. Thank you very much. As some of you know, I worked for a while in the former Soviet Union, so I want to share a story that Russian friends used to tell about themselves and to themselves. So one Russian bemoaning the state of society, bemoaning the lack of good food, bemoaning the weather, the price of sending kids to music school, Everything has just become an absolute catastrophe, complaining, very pessimistic about everything, on and on and on. And the Russian optimist looks at this person who's saying, nothing couldn't possibly get any worse. And the optimist goes, what? Of course it could. <laughs> so with, with that notion of optimism and pessimism, I will tell you that I'm more optimistic than the Russian optimist. Um, about what we're about and I think what we truly can accomplish. But we have our work cut out for us. This is not an easy task. And I start with a story and I have seven points that I want to put out here for us to then maybe come back and discuss. But the first point is about storytelling and the imperative of telling narratives and stories that have richness and depth and that work. My view is that facts are bookends for what's the acceptable 
debate, but what happens in terms of decisions in between that set of facts is often determined not by the facts, by the stories. Second point is, and a number of these points are things that we know, but sometimes the things we know so well we forget about because they're just ingrained in us. But that food and eating is a deeply, deeply emotional activity. It's primal, it's sensual, it's about risk and risk aversion. We, when we eat, are the opposite of what the economists like to posit as a rational economic actor. That's not what we're doing. It's a fundamentally deeply emotional activity. And as we're trying to reach people in that space, we need to really keep that front and center. Third, there, we have to keep in mind choices, offering choices and the choices that are either suppliers or diners or customers make. And there was interesting data uh, yesterday from the Good Housekeeping presentation. And I wondered with some of that if people were pushed, for example, trust was a big driver of what people buy, so was taste. What happens if you push a person to respond to, well, you really think it tastes pretty good, but you really don't trust that it's good for you? What do you do then? So how do we help people well, know what those choices are and then think those choices through? We're also in a really unusual position in terms of how the tr many of the transactions take place when we're engaged in a fine dining situation. People spend a lot of, a lot of time in, the, in a restaurant. It's not like a quick shopping expedition. It's not like going and buying something quickly. So we have a huge opportunity, yes, to serve wonderful food and yes, to create an ambiance and environment, but maybe there's more. And what should that more look like that doesn't undermine the, those, those, those other things. Part of what underlies, I believe, the relationship of food and chefs and at times companies to people who eat food, all of us, is trust. And I don't think we yet know enough and understand enough about that dynamic. I think it's a big piece of the whole certification, explosion in certification. I think it underlies a lot of the questions and the words about local, organic, sustainable. So I think we need to explore and understand more how that trust is built and how it could potentially slip away. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, the, I guess the fifth point is, and I've mentioned a little bit about this notion of time when I talked about the, the movie yesterday, but I think we really have a a task at hand, not only to look at prices, but to look at the relative amount of time it takes to complete certain parts of the journey through the food system. Because that has a huge bearing on what we think we can do, what we can't do, or what we might be able to do if we change that amount of time. I think we also can try, and these are just a messaging kind of idea or a notion that's by no means fully formed, but that we should, I think, explore which is food an expense or is it an investment? Right? Is, food that, is, is purchasing food, are we buying something short term and thinking of it as an expense or is it an investment in health? Is it an investment in community? And how do we both individually, mentally account for it and how organizationally and institutionally do we think about food? And that plays back to the time question as well in terms of those two different ways we calculate economics. I think also as we're trying to talk more about changing the food system or how, where is the right role for chefs in this effort to change the food system or to improve the food system, I think it's really important, and this is where the optimism pessimism point comes back, we can do that. I mean, the power, the knowledge, the gravitas, the enjoyment, the ability to provide pleasure is all there. But there are also embedded, entrenched systems, mental systems, financial systems, infrastructure systems that don't necessarily want to change the way we think maybe the system ought to be changed. Um, and we ought not be underestimate the power of intransigence and if money is going to be shifting from one place to another, there are powerful players that probably don't want to do that. 
And as we think about how to move forward, we need to map that, understand that, and yes, try to figure out how to bring people who might be feeling like their, pardon me, cow is going to get gored, in the, on the bring, have an open enough table that they can come and be with us. Um, but we also need to be realistic about not everybody's going to join, and there will be um, opposition. But with that uh, opposition notwithstanding, I do, I do remain optimistic even more so than the Russian optimists. Thank you. <laughs> So, good morning. Can you all hear me? I'm so honored to be here. Thank you to the James Beard Foundation and Good Housekeeping and Karen Carp of Carp Resources for uh, allowing me to be here today and talk to you a little bit about what's going on on the federal level as far as food, food policy, and legislation. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit more fact-based um, because I really want to give you the information that I think you want about what bills are coming up and um, the things that really pertain to your industry and your causes. Um, my name again <clears throat> is Wendy Gelman. I'm a senior counsel and senior policy advisor to United States Senator Kirsten E. Gillibrand of New York, um, based here in the New York City office. And um, I do a ton of outreach, which means that I go out and meet with people, um, run programs. One of our um, big programs that we like to bring to our constituents is grants workshops and encouraging people to apply for grants. I brought with me, and they're on the table, a form that has um, all the different grant guides our office has. They're all federal grants, so they apply to wherever you are. Um, we really encourage um, not-for-profits and other organizations to apply for grants and to seek the support of their legislators when you do that. Um, it's a good source of money. The money is there. And with other uh, funding cuts, particularly USDA, has some really wonderful grant programs. So we really encourage you to check those out. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that within my portfolio is not just food and school lunch, but education as a whole, pre-K through post-grad, arts and cultural institutions, tourism, and uh, health care. And as all of you in this room have demonstrated this morning with just your comments, all of those areas overlap and have to play together. Food is a major um, tourism di uh, destination. The importance to health care cannot be overstated. Um, Food is an expression. It is an art form. I'm sure the Culinary Institute would agree with that. So all of these things play together, and we all need to partner in all of these fields to um, get where we want to go to make the changes that need to be made. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now, well, a lot bit, if my t that timer is making me nervous, um, about this, the senator and her um, robust initiatives in the agriculture area. Senator Jill Band is New York's first member of the Agricultural Committee in over 40 years. And it is wonderful to have a senator from New York when we have over 35,000 farms that stretch across 7.1 million acres. Um, the center is working to improve and infect change in agriculture and our food system and our country with legislative initiatives. The bill that everyone's been talking about in this conference, I assume, and I know came up this morning with Sam Cass, is the Farm Bill. Uh, Congress is now preparing to write and debate the next Farm Bill. This, our senator, Senator Gillibrand in New York, has spent a lot of time over the last year visiting farm communities across the state and really holding listen, listening sessions to gather from the actual farmers what their needs are and how best to serve them in the Farm Bill. Um, so some of her priorities for the Farm Bill have to do with dairy pricing. Um, as probably most of you know, uh, farmers have been paid for their milk through a complicated regionally based system called the Federal Milk Marketing Order, FMMO. Um, it was initially developed to price milk based on demand, but because these triggers were not transparent to the average producer, 
and prices were announced on a monthly delay. This made farmers unable to respond to the market, resulting in extreme volatility in both productions and income to farmers. So Senator Gilbert is working to include in the Farm Bill um, what we call the Dairy Pricing Reform and Farmer Protection Act. That's she is, legislation she is writing that would reform the FM. Oh, FMMO system, and it will improve transparency and improve price discovery. Um, another priority for the Farm Bill is the dairy safety net. Um, dairy farmers have long relied on the milk income loss contract, milk um, program, to help make ends meet when prices are low. Are, are people familiar with these things? Yes, no, yes. Okay, so. Um, the center's proposal would benefit small and medium-sized farms by ensuring payments for 90% of production when the mar margin between feed and market prices is less than $6, um, up to the current milk production limit. And this will also help larger farms by ensuring that they also receive payment when the margin is less than $4. So it's a safety net when the cost of feed is high and market prices are low. Third uh, priority, not in any kind of ranking order, is supporting specialty crops, which I know is near and dear to a lot of you here. Um, specialty crops include fruits, vegetables, maple, honey, and horticulture products. They generate nearly $1.4 billion for New York's economy alone each year. Um, they account for one-third of New York's agriculture industry. So to continue to support specialty crop farmers, Senator Gillibrand is fighting to protect specialty crop block grants that ensure the long-term viability of specialty crops. The current Farm Bill provides $55 million each year in grants that support research, grower education, consumer outreach, and market development. Uh, and New York has been fortunate to receive over $1 million of funding for this each year. So we're fighting to make sure that the funding is maintained uh, d during these difficult economic times. New topic, food deserts, which I know everyone here has been talking a lot about. And I'd just like to familiarize you a little bit with some of the legislative initiatives being taken to try and solve this terrible problem. Um, as you all know, more than 20 million people live in areas known as food deserts where they are out of reach of a supermarket. Lack of access to a supermarket is a major barrier to families seeking to obtain fresh, nutritious food, and those are the foods they need to have a healthy um, life and lifestyle. Moreover, food desert communities are deprived of the economic benefits of local supermarkets, such as jobs and associated retail. So this is certainly a serious matter that needs attention. Senator Gilbert is fighting for the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. This will help bring more grocery stores, farmers markets, food cooperatives, and other options within reach of underserved community by providing one-time startup grants and affordable loan foundation. Uh, affordable loan financing. And what's interesting about this proposal, oh my god, I'm so running out of time. <laughs> I'm not even close. <laughs> oh no. Okay, I'm keeping going. Okay, uh, one of the interesting things to me about this legislation is that um, th there's going to be requirements for the types of organizations that are eligible for the funding. Minority and women-owned businesses would be given priority in funding along with projects that provide wages and benefits equal to or better than that of comparable businesses. Exactly the things that everyone here has been talking about, um, the workforce and fair treatment. It also provides for local house, uh, hiring agreements. Uh, healthy food financing, financing initiative has the ability to create and save hundreds <coughs> and thousands of jobs. So I'm running out of time, I have to skip that. Um, can I have some extra time for one of you guys? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. This is terrible. <laughs> I'm not even getting an Oscar. This is just brutal. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> connecting farms with markets. 
crucial issue to all of you here. We recognize <coughs> that this is essential, and we're working to improve the infrastructure that connects farms with markets in need of fresh produce. Here in New York City, we have the Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market, the largest produce distribution center in America. Um, but its infrastructure is impeding the ability of farms in upstate New York and across America to really harness the New York City uh, market and its location to access new markets. So currently, USDA is limited in the support it can provide for these projects of updating the um, produce distribution centers and infrastructure. Senator Gillibrand is working to enhance regional food system infrastructure funding, which is not easy to say, to strengthen available resources to support projects that connect farm communities to new markets. Um, so I hope what you're seeing here is a thread that the issues that are concerning you are definitely concerning us and that we are taking legislative initiatives to address them. So I'm just going to keep talking. Um, SNAP, which was mentioned before, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. We are pushing to create better access for SNAP, resi SNAP recipients by using wireless technology, the Electronic Benefits Transfer Terminals, EBTs, at farmers markets, um, this will take down another barrier that exists for um, underserved communities and lower income individuals to get fresh, nutri nutritious produce for their families. And it also recaptures some business for farmers that they're able to get um, food stamp payments. Um, we, we introduced legislation. The senator is pushing to change this. She introduced legislation in September that would provide farmers markets and other non-traditional retailers with wireless mobile EBT terminals that could accept SNAP payments. And that would be a huge improvement. Um, quickly, conservation, a major issue. We are working to strengthen conservation. Um, we're working to protect the EQIP program, environmental quality incentives program that helps farmers with resources they need to plan and implement conservation efforts. And the moment I've been waiting for since I've been practicing this speech is when I get to talk about the conservation on muck soils program, which does not come up in my everyday work, but I am so thrilled to get to talk about it here. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, or most of you, muck soils are the highly organic and valuable soils um, that we need to produce high yields, and they require significantly less commercial fertilizers than cops, crops grown on all other soil types. Um, they are only found in limited locations across the country, so we have to preserve them. The COMS program will provide up to $500 per acre for muck soil farmers who implement specific soil conservation practices that can significantly significantly reduce wind and water erosion and protect the soil. Um, community support agriculture. How many people here participate in a CSA? A lot. Um, so um, as you know, um, they're a renowned and proven system to directly connect the consumers with farmers who grow the food. Um, each week, members receive a weekly box containing their share of the farm's yield for that week. There are more than 12,000 CSA farms operating th throughout the United States. There are 350 in New York alone. We want to see that continue to rise, and it, it should rise steadily in the next coming years. So Senator Gillibrand has introduced the com Community Supported Agriculture Promotion Act. This was just introduced by her in July. It would establish a competitive grant program to award federal funds to nonprofits, extension services, and state and local government agencies to provide grower support to newer current CSA farmers as well as aid and distribution. Um, and one of the interesting things about this would preference would be given to projects working with family farms, farms operated by or employing veterans, um, this provision was specifically au authored by Senator Gillibrand and those that expand CSA reach into food deserts. And if I could just pivot a little bit, the Senator also sits on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate. Um, she's dedicated to serving the needs of our veterans. Our returning veterans will shortly be coming home from the Middle East, as well as veterans' families. And um, we need to ensure that they'll have adequate em employment and um, that access to this. So 
these are just some of the things we're working on as well as the reauthorization of the Child Nutrition Act, getting trans fats out of the diets of children, um, women, infants, and children's programs. All these areas are touched on by the Agriculture Committee and the work of the Senator. And I think that um, this conference should be um, not only it's a fantastic experience and exchange of ideas, but energize you to go out into your communities and to contact your representatives and tell them what you're seeing in the field, what needs you have, what changes you think you need to have made, and we could really benefit from hearing your brilliant ideas for what needs to be done. So thank you for letting me be here and listen to you. I'm sorry I went over. Um, I really apologize. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's worth it. We're uh, huge fans of Kristen Gillibrand and her work. She's really terrific. Um, anyway, um, I'm Michelle Nishan, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about some really good news. Um, we, Wholesome Wave is the group. Many of you may have heard of us, uh, might be in states where you've heard of this thing where where private money is doubling the value of SNAP or food stamp and WIC benefits when spent at a farmer's market on locally grown foods. Um, people love the program. We don't just do that because it's a good thing to do and it helps people make healthful food choices while providing income for farmers, but we collect data. And uh, we got it back and we're gonna start celebrating it soon, but just a few things I wanna uh, share with you. 2,000 SNAP recipients uh, and WIC recipients took our survey last year and um, the top reasons for them going to the farmer's market might surprise you. Number one was quality of produce, not the incentives. Number three was supporting local farmers and local businesses. Number six was the price of the produce because of the incentives. There is demand in these underserved communities, which is good news for those of you that are doing educational outreach because these communities are very aware, thanks to the internet, that they should be feeding their families better. They know what they need to do to feed their families better. They might not necessarily know how to cook it, but I saw an African-American man who is raising the three children of his deceased sister pick up kohlrabi and say, what the hell is this and what do I do with it because I can afford it. <laughs> so you introduce affordability and it makes education a lot easier because people know what they should be doing for their family. 10% um, of our farmers added acreage, 15% of our par farmers increased the diversity of their plant, uh, their plantings because we're looking at ethnically diverse markets, we diversified their market, um, and almost 10% added hoop houses because people on SNAP, when they find affordability and access in the same place in the same time, they go to the farmer's markets in the cold of November when we don't. They go there and the farmers are encouraged by that because they're continuing to go and look for the good food. Interesting stuff. Um, so that program teaches us that there is demand in underserved communities for health, healthy food. It, this was in, in 20 states, 120 farmers markets, uh, 1,700 farmers participated as well. There is demand, there's no doubt. So, so let's not fool ourselves on that one. Uh, another program that we'll be happy to report on this spring, Fruit and Vegetable Prescription Program, where we've raised enough private funding to do eight pilots where doctors are prescribing enough fruits and vegetables for an entire at-risk family to increase their consumption one to two servings per person so that they can go to a farmer's market, get locally grown fruits and vegetables, and guess what? Because it's a private prescription, they come back and get measured for height, weight, blood pressure, BMI. This spring, we're gonna be able to show a direct correlation between increased consumption and decreased health risk, and there's a target for that, Title VI, Section 4013 of the Health Bill, which shifts from, from reimbursing for treatment to reimbursing measurable prevention. Um, there's other good news. There's silo breaking. In the state of Massachusetts, the Department of Transitional Assistance, which is basically Health and Human Services, and the Department of Agriculture have co-funded these types of programs, including money from the city of Boston. We've now seen, as a result of many of our programs in five states, millions of public dollars go to support these types of programs now sustainably. When we were told four years ago, fat chance you'll ever see a public dollar going to incentivize already publicly funded projects like SNAP. It's already happened. Uh, that barrier has been broken. The question that it brings, because I do believe 
that this type of change is going to happen. I do believe that everybody in this room is going to take their part and put their stake in the ground in a way that is going to steer more money into these communities to increase affordability, to increase the opportunity for people to make healthy choices, the easy choice, all of the all of these sound bites that were that we're, we're pulling together around this. I believe we're going to make this happen. But what happens when the money goes into these communities? The businesses the business opportunities, the jobs, the infrastructure in these communities does not exist right now to accept that commerce. Save places, you know, save, 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 save projects like Hiley's and, and other small scale projects that are showing signs of scaling up to a certain extent. It's just not there. But there are, is $5 billion in new markets tax credits through Treasury, through the CDFI fund right now, that's been focused on housing and other infrastructural things that have real estate attached. Why not focus on food businesses that provide healthy food and healthy food options? Why does it only have to be grocery stores? Why can't it be the type of value-added processing facility that can take field run seconds from mid-sized farmers and create oven roasted vegetable lasagna in the state of New York from New York state grown eggplant, tomatoes, corn, and other dairy products so that it can go into the, the school system at the skill and the infrastructure level that currently exists. Imagine that. That's a healthy food financing initiative project, I believe. The distribution around that. I think it's great news that, that Walmart and a lot of these corporations, grocery corporations, have made a commitment to go into underserved communities and open grocery stores. You'll see probably four or 450 food de deserts get a grocery store. But what about the few thousand where they're not going to go? When we look at a company like Walmart, and they just granted Will Allen around a million dollars, I think that's just bri brilliant. It's not greenwashing to me. Will knows what to do with that million bucks. It's, he's going to put that to good use. When you look at the fact that they have the resources and they're trying to do the right thing and move into this space of enabling food access, they're trying. We don't know how genuine it is, but they've got resources and they're willing to spend them. So what about the notion that for every grocery store that one of these giant grocers goes into and gets advantage of new markets tax credits in these communities, they fund land grab for emerging farmers coming out of ag school, young farmers, brilliant people that don't even, not even out of ag school, we have people that are, that, that are engineer, you know, have an MBA in engineering that are now farming, sharecropping in South Florida, but have the brilliance to actually be able to handle a thousand acre farm, but all they can get their hands on is five acres. So when we look at what this money can be used for to put more people on the land, give them the financing for the equipment, build value-added processing facilities, community-owned grocery co-ops, invest in Hiley's model so that he can be a $10 million business instead of a $1 million business, the money is there, the decision makers are in this room, I really encourage us to just start pulling the trigger spending the money, investing it in our communities so that everybody can have a business, everybody can have a job, everybody can have a chance, and everybody can have an opportunity to put the same tomato on the table. Thank you. Well, the organizers of this panel uh, had hoped that this um, experience would inspire us, and I think you will agree that there is an abundance of energy and ideas that are emerging from the contributions of our panelists. And um, it, what we would like to do here is to uh, stimulate some exchange among the panelists to share uh, among themselves some reactions to the ideas that they have put before the group. And uh, after we have done that for a moment, then we will uh, turn to the audience and get questions and interaction from you as well. And what time are we aiming for here? Noon or oh, no. soon? Five minutes. Five minutes. OK, so this will be very brief. Yeah, OK. So uh, uh, I, uh, I was making a note of uh, the highlights of what each of you were uh, mentioning. And let me just um, draw attention to a few of what I think are the key things mentioned here. We began with uh, Greg telling us about both the opportunity and the urgency 
for chefs and those working in the $6 billion food service industry to realize the power <coughs> that they wield and to do so by becoming interdisciplinary. And I couldn't help but notice how much an embodiment of that Michelle Nishan is as an interdisciplinary chef who's doing more than just uh, cooking delicious food. So we see an example of what that uh, appeal was sitting uh, before us. And I couldn't also help to remark how fortunate the state of New York is that when you call upon the senior policy advisor uh, for one of the state senators, she doesn't have enough time to tell you about the things that that office is doing to support the sorts of things that people in this room are about. That is a tremendously fortunate position for the state to be in. Um, one other very important thing uh, that I thought was expressed here was uh, the good news uh, message that Michelle uh, brought to us with some very concrete ideas around new business models. And so I'd like to kick off discussion around that notion and tie it to something that um, Jonathan pointed out to us in a very pragmatic way. Uh, all of us in a setting like this uh, want to make certain that we are not viewed simply as agitators. And so we, we will talk about the fact that we do not want to set up adversarial relationships uh, or dynamics when attempting to shift the food system. Yet at the same time, Jonathan reminds us there are real powerful players. And when you get in between people and their billions, you will notice that they do not agree with your ideas. And so um, the, thing, the question that comes up for a group like this and that hopefully the panelists can give us some ideas about is that I, I can think of a way to deal with this and I can also think of what a tremendous pitfall it might be to follow um, uh, my advice on this. And so I want some wisdom on this. And that is that uh, we're working in a market paradigm. Uh, all of us have learned to speak that language uh, a little bit. Uh, supply and demand was appealed to several times here today and sometimes even as a controlling a paradigm of how to intervene. And, and of course that's very pragmatic, that's very uh, realistic. But um, perhaps, uh, and here's a suggestion, what we see occurring in that power dynamic is the failure of business models that are becoming outdated and not adjusting to the reality of the demand, what we really expect out of the food system today. And the market, in that sense, ought to adjust by rewarding people that come up with business plans that actually fill the opportunity and the realistic demand and aim for the future, rather than rewarding folks that are attempting to make the world bend to their outdated business plan. So that there's an opportunity there, and Michelle spoke uh, directly to that, new business models and new policies that actually support the sort of food environment that we want. It strikes me, though, that, uh, and I saw some heads nod with that, that the pitfall with that is that, uh, as thinkers like Paul ha uh, Hawken and Herman Daly and Bill McKibben have told us, is that that paradigm is actually inimical to many of the things that we're driving for because it undervalues or actually ignores many of the things that we think are of value. What is measurable, what is counted as profit, you know, how you count up scores, not actually captured in that paradigm of the market. And so the pitfall is that if we attempt to play that game, we may actually become victims of that game. And so I'd like to throw that out. It may be too complex a, or hopelessly complex a question to deal with here. Um, there are microphones behind you. I see you already have one. So Jonathan, could you kick us off with some reactions to that? Yeah, watching the clock go down to 1.32, um, pretty Sorry tough question. <laughs> right, so we live, yeah, we live in a market economy, but we live in a very imperfect market economy. And there's two ways traditionally that that gets addressed. One is the government steps in and evens out where the market failures are such that the market doesn't fail anymore. The second is the whole, all the learnings we have from resource and natural economics now um, that tell us about externalities that are not yet priced into the things that we're buying and the food that we're buying. So those two forces are the traditional ways of dealing with market failure. Whether those are enough uh, or whether there are I, I think your caution is also right, which is that I don't know that relying on being able to move the market is going to be sufficient to address this problem. I think there is behind, because we're not all market actors in a literal sense, in a, in a, in a, it's not all that we do. So I think moving consciousness and changing behaviors and showing success stories is also critical to making the whole system more amenable to change. Um, I, I, I would like to propose something because I, I think um, when we look at getting in between those with their billions, if we looked at all of the, the program-related investment funds that could be made available right now, if we look at new markets tax credits that are available right now, if we look at the amount of grants, farm credit, 
the grants that Farm Credit brings. There literally are billions and billions of dollars right now. Pick a place. Make it Iowa. I get to see Fred more often. Um, you know, make it Iowa. Pick a place and look at aggregate all of the educational needs, um, the market demand, uh, the infrastructural needs, the land needs, the soil health, all of the subjects that we all know uh, need to exist in a healthy food system. Pick a place, throw the money there, learn from the failures, celebrate the successes when you prove that everything that we're saying we know to be true is more than a theory, we make it a reality in one place, it creates a platform that, for the type of political will that can get us back to where government can challenge this divide that we've also been talking about between the very few that have and the very few that don't and how people are going to want to hang on to that money and power. Let's just create a model, please. Spend the money. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, there's it, it's sort of building on the same same thing. There's nothing that succeeds like success. I mean, you look at the, the volume food service sector in our industry. Um, you know, there was a point maybe 10 years ago when a lot of people tried to introduce healthier uh, options on their menus, and they failed, and they came back, and they said, well, our customers don't want this. And so what are you going to do when, 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 you know, when they say that? Now the conversation has completely changed in the industry, in, turn, in the, the chain and volume sector. Uh, and there's fabulous new leadership at the National Restaurant Association. The, the, the sort of the circle the wagons and defend uh, you know, current practices. I mean, sure, there is still some of that, but there's a fundamental sense that the consumer is shifting. And that just enables all kinds of change. Absolutely. Wendy, would you like to have the last word? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that, should I, we uh, take some time for the audience or should we actually, okay. So there's enough interactivity planned for after this session that we'll just go straight into that. Thank you very much to our panelists.